of the most frustrating things in life is when you know what you should be doing, but you don't know how to do it, right? Has anyone ever experienced this? I remember when I was learning to swim. I, like, I, I knew that my legs and my bottom were meant to be high in the water. I knew my head was meant to have a particular position. I knew that when I breathed, I was meant to just rotate my head and not my whole body. I knew that I was meant to reach out far, but I just couldn't do it. I had Coach Neen in the pool yelling things like, chin down, legs up, I reach out. And I'm like, I can't do it. So frustrating when we know what we're supposed to do, but we don't know how to do it. I wonder if you've ever come across a scripture where you're like, I get, I get that scripture. I get that that's what I'm supposed to do. But how do I actually do that? Like, how do I love my neighbor well? I live in Smoko on 100 acres. I don't even have a neighbor, right? <laughs> or how do I be generous? I mean, I'm struggling to make ends meet myself. Like, how do I be generous? Well, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Paul's theme for the second half of the book of Ephesians, which was walk this way. Walk this way. Walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling to which we've been called. Well, the great thing about today's scripture is that he actually unpacks for us how. He goes into what it is that we do in an effort to walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling. And he breaks down for us a, a rudimentary pattern for outworking this. Three things that while not exhaustive, are absolute pillars if we're to walk in a manner that's worthy of our call. And the first one is this, to live in unity. Verse 1, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. Verse 3, Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Then Paul even breaks down how we do this, right? How we be unified. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Four things that are essential ingredients in the recipe of unity as God's people. Gentleness, patience, showing tolerance in love and humility. Now, I don't have time to unpack all four, but I wonder this morning if you just stop for a second, close your eyes. I want you to think. I want you to imagine. What would it be like in our church? What would it feel like to come here on a Sunday to do life with each other if these things, patience, gentleness, tolerance, defined us? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine how welcome you'd feel? How free and vulnerable you'd be able to be? If these things defined us, like not popped up now and then when we were having a good week, but were literally part of our DNA. That's Paul's vision for us this morning. Well, the last of the four attributes Paul mentions is the one that I want to stop and focus on for just a second. Because in many ways, it's, it's the granddaddy of all these things. It's the granddaddy of all these attributes. In fact, I would go as far to say that there is no other important quality compared to chasing humility in life, full stop. Even quote me on that one day, I don't mind. Because every other quality, like patience or gentleness or showing tolerance for one another in love, can only be properly pursued to the degree that we have humility, right? 
And while I'd love to preach a whole sermon on humility and walk you through the entire Bible and show you how every sin and every separation from God, every deviation from blessing and life finds its root in pride, the antithesis of humility. I can't do that this morning, but maybe I will one day. What I do want to offer is just a super quick cursory introduction to what humility is and isn't, as it's the key ingredient for us learning to live in unity. Firstly, humility is not, everyone say is not, is not the denial of self. It's not the denial of self. It's popular belief, I think, in Christian circles that if we're really humble, that means we deny ourselves. It's actually not the denial of the self. It's the reorientation of the self. Humility is also not the loathing of oneself. It's not thinking that you're awful. You know, that worm, you know, mentality, oh, I'm just, I'm terrible, I'm awful, I'm self-loathing, debasing. Humility's not that. We, we, you know, we, we don't garner God's approval or impress Him or become humble by thinking we're worthless and insignificant. No, we're very significant. Humility's not that. No, humility is primarily a heart attitude And essentially, I want you to catch this, it's the balancing act of two truths, okay? Humility is the balancing act of two truths. The first is the recognition that we and others have supreme value and significance because we have been made in the image of God, amen? Secondly, though, Humility is a personal acknowledgement of our spiritual bankruptcy. It's personal acknowledgement that without the free and unbelievable gift of grace that's ours in Jesus, that we were stuffed. That we were, as Paul said earlier, doomed, dead, and what was the third? Disobedient. Glad I can remember my own stuff. And so humility is this this balancing of these two truths. Now, I had to borrow this. It's not mine, so you can't keep it. Who am I going to pick? I feel like I'm picking on Emma this morning. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, Do you want 50 bucks? Of course, you're a uni student. You want 50 bucks. Now, if I told you that that $50... Um, I don't know, was weed on at some stage. (laughs) Would you still want that $50? Of course you would. (laughs) If I told you that that $50 at one point in time was used for for gambling, would you still want that $50? Of course you would. If I told you that that $50 was used to buy drugs or that $50 was used to, you know, pay someone for some immoral service, would you still want, would you still want, would you still see value in that $50? Of course. Because we see the inherent value of a $50 note. You see, irrespective of where that $50 has been, irrespective of what choices that $50 has been caught up in, we can still immediately determine that it has value, right? You know, the same is true with humility. When we come to each other and we focus on the supreme value that each one has, irrespective of how they dress, irrespective of how short they might fall morally, irrespective of the fact that they might frustrate us or offend us time and time and time and time again, humility is about still being able to see that inherent value that we all have. And the second truth that humility has is knowing that, or is building upon that idea that that inherent value that we all have 
He stemmed from a realization that we were stuffed without Jesus, that we were in need, desperate need of His grace. And the reality is this, right? There is zero way that we can live in unity if humility isn't our operating system. We cannot live in unity with one another if we do not see the first port of call when I see Ed or Linda or whoever, that inherent value that is theirs because they are divine image bearers. We cannot live in unity if humility is not our operating system. There's no way patience, there's no way tolerance, there's no way gentleness can grow or be cultivated long term without it either, is there? Friends, it's only when we begin walking in patience and gentleness and tolerance and most of all humility that we can begin living in the way of unity. Church, we must live in unity And only as we do this will we begin to walk in a manner that's worthy of the call to which we have been called. The second area that Paul says is paramount. If we're to walk worthy of our call is not just to live in unity, but it's to engage in ministry. Everyone say with me, one, two, three, engage in ministry. Verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, not only does Paul go off on a mega tangent here, he quotes Psalm 68, but he doesn't quote it verbatim. He puts his own spin on it. And so if this feels kind of confusing or you're a bit distracted on what on earth he's trying to say here, let me help you. Verse 7 summarizes that we've been given a special gift of grace or a special endowment that everyone's been given this for the purpose of verse 12 so that the body of Christ may be built up. These are the bookends of all of what Paul's trying to say in that section just there. That everyone's been given a gift and that the point of that gift is to build up the body of Christ. You see, we come across Paul's list of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And sometimes I think we can kind of unhelpfully get bogged down in these five examples. We even build whole doctrines and axioms from this list. You might have heard of one of them. It's called the fivefold ministry. Anyone heard of that? This principle came straight out of this list. Now, I'm not saying these offices, pastor, teacher, etc., aren't important, and that frameworks like the fivefold ministry can't be helpful in structuring our intentionality to build the church. But this is not Paul's point in this passage. Nor is this list an exhaustive list or the only list. You see, you only need to read the rest of Paul's letters to know that he offers all sorts of lists in all sorts of letters, including all sorts of gifts and roles and all sorts of things. See, the point of the passage isn't around those five things. The point of the passage is that everyone has been graced both practically and spiritually with a gift and everyone is expected to use them for building up the saints. Now, I have to tell you that for the majority of us, 
This should be a, a, a deeply challenging thing. You see, there's a principle in the business world called the Pareto Principle. Has anyone heard of the Pareto Principle? You probably don't recognize the name, but I'm pretty sure you're going to recognize the principle. It's simply this. The Pareto Principle highlights that in general, 80% of the outputs come from 20% of the inputs, the 80-20 rule. You know what I'm talking about now? Yeah, a lot more heads. Meaning 80% of production or of growth or of impact of an organization comes from 20% of the people, systems, initiatives of that organization. Now, I'd have to say that at Bright Church of Christ, we buck this trend. We buck this trend. I don't believe that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I think it's far worse. I think 10% of the community combined to contribute to about 80% of our impact. And you think I'm being too harsh? Let me give you a recent example. A couple of weeks ago, I was asked on behalf of Joy Cox to look for a couple of volunteers to help in our cleaning. Three pregnant women, all about to give birth to a child, and she tells me that they're hobbling around, some of these like six, seven, eight months pregnant with a vacuum cleaner trying to clean. She said, well, you know, can, can we get some people to, to help out? I'm like, of course. Like, we're a family. This should be pretty easy, right? Shouldn't be very difficult to you know, do the work of ministry and support our sisters in Christ? Anyone want to have a guess how many people put up their hand to help? Don't guess. Four people. Four people in our entire congregation said, yeah, I'm happy to help. Do you want to know the worst part about that four people? Two of them were already on the cleaning roster. Like, two of them were already on the cleaning roster. You know who the other two were? Myself and Adam Lindsay, who it's fair to say does a lot in serving this church, right? 80% of the work done by 20% of the people. This is a business principle. It shouldn't be a kingdom reality, right? This should not be our kingdom reality. We should not be seeing a business principle at work itself in the house of God, amen? You know, this morning, if you're sitting here this morning and you're like, you know what, I'm in that 20% or I'm not in that 20%, And you know what? I come to this church, yeah, and I call this church home. And you're not meaningfully serving the church with your time and talents. Don't get angry at me. Paul would say this. Houston, we have a problem. Paul would say, I'm sorry, but there's no excuse for this. Nowhere in the whole Bible. You don't think you're gifted enough, Paul would say? Can you push a vacuum cleaner? You don't think you're gifted enough? Can you help supervise some kids in jam or youth or in a baby's nursery that we hope to get off the ground? Can you pour water into a teacup? Maybe your excuse is, well, I don't have time. Friend, the question is not about having time. The question is about how do you prioritize your time? You know, you have the same amount of hours in a week as every single one of us, 168. I want to tell you what Elon Musk does with his 168 hours in a week. Not only does he run one of the biggest companies in the world, in Tesla, with over 100,000 employers. Just think about that number, right? 100,000 employers. But outside of his Tesla 9 to 5, which by the way is no 9 to 5, right? Outside of that, one of his 
hobbies was to found SpaceX, like the leading private aerospace company in the entire world. I don't know about you, but if I even did that, I'd be pretty happy with myself. Wouldn't you? That's pretty epic. Not only this, but Musk is well documented for reading, and I'm glad you're sitting down because you'll fall over, over 250 books a year. Man, some of you guys are retired or like reading is like your jam. It's like your greatest passion. And you'd be lucky to read 50 to 60 books a year, right? And on top of running Tesla and founding and running SpaceX, this dude's reading 250 books a year. And we struggle to read three verses of scripture a day. You know, the confronting reality of the passage this morning is Paul is like, this time thing, this is not an excuse. If you want to walk in a way worthy of our calling, if the gift of salvation that we've received in Christ means anything to us or at least means enough to shape or alter our life, then hear Paul very carefully that to live in a manner worthy of our calling not only means to live in unity, but it means to engage in ministry. Friends, we've all been given gifts and abilities. Complex, simple, doesn't matter. And we've all been given the same mandate. Use who you are and what you can do to serve the body of Christ. And I just want to add a little P.S. P.S., volunteering at the local Lions Club or the community health center or something like that, that does not nullify or replace your call to serve the church. It's awesome, it's biblical, but it doesn't replace it, amen? Paul clearly says that to live in a manner worthy of our calling, we must engage in building up the saints. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a saint. Just wanted to take the tension out of the room. The final area that Paul encourages us or highlights as crucial or absolutely necessary in our journey of living worthy of our calling is to grow in maturity. i never forget when I started dating Bianca in my early 20s. Just remember that part of the story, early 20s. I was chatting to her on the phone as I was driving home from tennis, the same Christian tennis club I got kicked out of um, for throwing tennis rackets. <clears throat> and I remember I'm driving home and I'm chatting to her on the phone and I'm trying to suss out what she might be up to the next day at uni. I'm probing because I want to have lunch with her. You see, she's just started studying in the city really close. Her uni was really close to mine. And so I'm thinking, cool, like, you know, I'd, I'd like to, you know, have lunch with you. Another little bit of helpful information in this story that I'll add is that she just struck up a new friendship with this girl at her uni, right? And so lots of her time and excitement and energy was around this new friendship she had. Anyone ever experienced a friend that you were like besties with and suddenly they started dating someone and you're like, Sorry, where have you gone? Like, do I even know you anymore? Or you, like, had a boyfriend and, like, you know, he was, like, now wanting to spend time with the boys? And there's that, an element of grief and jealousy, right? That's, like, as you start to work out, oh, man, I have to share this person with the rest of the world. What? Well, let's just say I wasn't adapting to that transition very well. Because as I asked her what she was up to for lunch the next day, she said, oh, I was going to have lunch with Jess, this said friend. <laughs> That's how I felt. 
And so I did what every rational and emotionally intelligent person does. And without saying a word, I mean, the moment I heard those words, oh, I was thinking about having lunch with Jess, beep, I hung up on her. (laughs) Not only that, guess better, I turned my phone off so she couldn't even ring me. Poor thing thought I was like in a car crash or something. And the worst part is, turns out she was going to say, oh, I was going to have lunch with Jess, but I'd love to have lunch with you, Matt. I mean, talk about being immature, right? I mean, instead of acting in accordance to what I knew was right or true or wise, I acted in in accordance to how I felt. Instead of prioritizing what was important at our relationship, my serving her in love, I prioritized what was immediate. My need to be the center of her world or to be in control. Instead of being mature, I was immature. You know, our English word maturity comes from the old Latin word. Some of you may have even studied this in high school. Maturus. And the word maturus means ripe. Bet you didn't see that coming. I didn't either. And I've got to admit, when I looked up this word, I was like, where am I going to go with this? That was not what I was thinking it meant, right? (laughs) And then all of a sudden, it hit me. What's the purpose of fruit? Like, as a thing, what's the purpose of fruit? What's fruit designed for? To eat, right? Consumption. That's its purpose. Now, when do you eat a piece of fruit? When it's ripe. So catch this. Being ripe is the state in which something must become before it's ready to be used for its intended purpose. Whoo! Only once something is ripe, only once something is fully flavored and fully ready for its purpose, then can it be used in that way. And really, when you think about it, isn't this what maturity is? This is the game of maturity. Maturity is the state of being ready and fully equipped to be and live in line with our purpose, which is to be vessels and carriers of the kingdom of God. Amen. And so any degree of immaturity in us, whether social, emotional, or spiritual, is a degree, catch this, is a degree to which we are ill-equipped and ineffective, ill-equipped and ineffective to fulfill our calling and purpose. And this is why Paul's third imperative for living worthy of our calling is to grow in maturity. Now, praise the Lord, he doesn't say to be mature, right? (laughs) Because in this life without Christ, we will never be at that stage where we are perfectly ready to fulfill our purpose, right? But his imperative is to grow in in maturity. Verse 13, become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. Paul is saying we cannot, and I want this to sink in, We cannot claim to walk in a way that's worthy of the gospel if we are not growing in maturity. If we're not becoming riper and riper, closer and closer to the state in which we can be fully used and fully embody all that God has purposed for us. 
And I think this is a challenge, right? Particularly for seasoned Christians. I mean, once we've become Christians and God's kind of arrested our hearts and cleaned up some of the major things in our lives, we can kind of take our foot off the gas. We can kind of get to a place where, I don't know, we feel like we've made it. Not that we're perfect, but you know, like, well, I sorted out my soul for eternity and all that kind of stuff. I, I can kind of get back now to living my life, albeit with some, you know, Jesus dust sprinkled on it. The challenge Paul has for us, though, is that we are only living in a manner worthy of our calling when we are progressing week to week, month to month, year to year into a more and more accurate depiction of the image of Christ, amen? When we are perpetually, constantly, steadily growing in maturity. And I, and I wonder this morning, are there areas of our life that we've gotten stagnated in? That you've stopped growing in maturity? Have you gotten to an amicable stage in your marriage? And it seems good enough. I mean, maybe you're sitting there going, Matt, I've been married longer than you've been alive. Shut up. What would you know? Regarding marriage, not as much as you potentially. In regarding this passage, a lot. And check this out. God's vision, Paul's imperative, is that we're continually growing in maturity. Getting better and better at serving our spouse ahead of serving our own wants and needs. Getting better and better at communicating our feelings and not acting them, amen. Getting better and better at praying for our spouse. Honoring our spouse, giving our spouse, sacrificing for our spouse. That's the process of maturity and that's what we're called to. Maybe you're relatively immature in your spiritual maturity, given the number of years you've been a Christian. This was the issue for the Christians at the church at Corinth, if you remember. And dare I say it, I think this is probably our greatest challenge when it comes to maturity. I heard a commentator say that the, the West in the 21st century is full of old, immature, spiritually infants. Old people, spiritually infants. And I kind of think, you know, they may be right. Look at what Paul says in Corinthians. Brothers and sisters... I mean, just let this sink in. Like, this is a smack in the face. I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, whoo, like everything we claim to do. I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. Wow. It, here's a prophetic message for our church, for us. We will not encounter God the way we say we want to, we will not see answers to prayers that our heart longs for. We will not experience God's will in our lives or witness to our community in a life-changing way if we do not spiritually grow up. If we spend more time bickering and complaining about each other or what we don't like about church than we do for praying for each other and participating in serving the church. 
if we spend more time and more of our energy building a successful life than a Christ-like one. If we continue to know more about what's happening in the lives of our friends on Facebook or on the news than we do about the Bible. I mean, here's a starting point. I don't know where you're at, but if you're not feeding on the Word of God every day, and yes, that might mean sacrificing some Netflix time or some gardening time, then you will die a spiritual infant. A person who did not live in a manner worthy of our call. Church, I'm not trying to put the heavy on you this morning. But I think we've got to get a little bit desperate with this. The greatest work of the enemy, listen to this. The greatest work of the enemy in our day and age is lulling us into the fetal position so that we can spend our lives suckling on the warm milk of our culture and this world and doing so, miss out on everything that Christ has for us. We must grow in maturity. Friends, I I don't know where you're at this morning. But Paul's message is clear. We cannot walk out our faith. I didn't rehearse this and I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say this, but I almost feel like don't claim to be a Christian if you're not prepared. Hear me. I'm not saying you've got to be perfect. Don't claim to be a Christian to have faith in Jesus if we can't do the three things that Paul says are imperatives for those who would say, yeah, I'm an apprentice of Jesus. To live in unity with each other, to engage in ministry, and to grow in maturity. Trying to be a little bit practical, I have a list that I'm going to leave at the back of the wall. And it has a whole bunch of areas in our church that if you're not one of the 10% that's serving, put your name there. I've even got a section that says other. If I haven't thought of it and there's something on your heart that you think you could do to build this church, to engage in ministry, put it here. Because the point is this. I don't want to see you walk out those doors and back in a week later, having not had God arrest your heart, that those three things, bare minimum, have got to be in a process of progression in your life. Learning to be humble and walk in unity with one another engaging in ministry and growing in maturity. It's only then that I believe that we have the audacity to then say, yeah, I walk in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but the the bright lights of this world, they're, they're pretty cool. They get me distracted too sometimes. There are things here that, yeah, it's pretty seductive. It's pretty fun. That that milk of our culture and world is pretty tasty. I don't want to get to heaven, though, and be face to face to my Creator and Him to more or less say, why did you snuggle in a cot with Zeph sucking milk all day, mate? I called you to be a carrier of my kingdom. In fact, you said you wanted to be. You asked me to be the Lord of your life. And then you didn't walk in a way that was worthy of the gospel. And my prayer this morning 
is can we be a church that learns to walk worthy of the gospel that not only saved us, but we were called to. Let's pray. Father God, I, 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 I totally get the difficulty in living a life that's to the beat of our culture's drum and our world's drum. I totally get the, the, the tendency for our heart to just want to suckle on milk. Tastes good. Feels good. It's comfortable. But God, I know that I am not called, that we are not called to walk, to live in a manner that's worthy of our world, but that's worthy of the gospel to which we've been saved and called. And God, my deep prayer this morning is would you help us just start with these three. I know there's more than this. And it doesn't have to be overcomplicated, but you, that you would help us to start with these three things. To actively learn to live in unity with one another. To think through our mind when we see one another. Even the people that frustrate us. Man, they're like a hundred dollar bill. Doesn't matter what they've done, where they've been. They have inherent value to take seriously. Number two, that you've called us, all of us, not special gifted people, but all of us have been given gifts by you, for you, and for building up our little church in Brighton. God, I pray that you stir our hearts. And finally, God, I pray that you help us grow in maturity, that we wouldn't get comfortable with the level of holiness that we've been able to attain in this area or that area. That we would go, hang on, no, no, am I growing in maturity? Am I just suckling on the world's milk? Or am I learning to walk in a manner worthy of the very salvation that I've been given and offered through Christ? And so God, my prayer is that you would give us the courage and most of all the discipline to put away the excuses to put away the justifications and to be honest with you and ourselves once and for all say something's got to change or I will die a suckling infant so God, I pray, stir in our hearts. I thank you that you're so gracious in this whole process. That you don't have a, a stick ready to whack us when we stop. It's almost less about the performance and more about the intentionality to participate in these things. So God, I pray, move. I pray, stir. I pray, begin that work in us, God.